Dr. Rico here. This is a lecture from my mini course, Robotic Planning and Kinematics. The syllabus and notes are in the description. All right, welcome to chapter seven on rotation matrices. A little introduction and we'll jump right into section 7.1. In this chapter, we study the set of rotation matrices and all their properties, including how to compose them and how to parametrize them. 7.1, which is the focus of this video, from reference frames to general rotation matrices. We continue our study of the properties of reference frame rotation matrices introduced in section 6.3. First, we note two characterizing properties of each reference frame rotation matrix. We then define rotation matrices independently of reference frame by just requiring them to satisfy the two characterizing properties. Very clever of us, right? The two characterizing properties. We present two important properties of reference frame rotation matrices. We will later show that each matrix that satisfies these properties must represent a rotation. Lemma 8.1 orthonormal columns and rows. Let R10 be the reference frame rotation matrix in either dimension two or three, representing a frame sigma one with respect to another frame sigma zero. The following facts are true and equivalent. One, the columns of R10 form a complete set of orthonormal arrays, that is, orthogonal and the unit length. That's what orthonormal means. And two, the transpose of R10 times R10 is the identity matrix in either two or three dimensions. Proof. By definition of the reference frame sigma one, the vectors x1, y1, and z1 are orthonormal. Therefore, also, the three arrays, x1, y1, z1, in the zero reference frame, have the properties that x10 transpose x10 equals y10 transpose y10 equals z10 transpose z10 equals one. The dot product of each of them is one. And the x10 transpose y10, y10 transpose z10, x1 transpose z10 equals zero because the value of the dot product is independent of the reference frame. This proves statement one in the lemma. Regarding statement two, for r10 equals x10, y10, z10, we write r10 transpose like this. Okay, so we can transpose each of these vectors in the array and compute <clears throat> the product here, which as we compute it, and in this form it is clear that these transpose products or dot products that we just looked at um, are zeros on the off diagonal and ones on the diagonal, and therefore we have the identity matrix. So we have used the definition of the matrix product and property one. All right, good. So that's for lemma 8.1. Note, it is true that R transpose R is equal to the identity matrix in the dimension that you're working in if and only if R R transpose is also equal to the identity matrix. Therefore, it suffices to verify that the columns of R are orthogonal to imply that also its rows are orthogonal. Lemma 8.2, the positive determinant. In dimension 2 and dimension 3, we have the determinant of R10 equal to positive 1. Proof. As we reviewed in equation 6.7 in the appendix to the previous chapter, chapter 6, the determinant of a 3x3 three three matrix is given by the triple product among its columns. So the determinant of R10 is equal to the determinant of R10 written out in its column form. 
and that is the triple product of its columns in this way. But we know that x10 cross y10 is equal to z10, okay, because it's a right hand reference frame. And we therefore know that this is just z10 dot z10, which is positive one, okay? So that is the proof. The set of rotation matrices. We are now finally ready to define rotation matrices independently of reference frames, okay? That was what we were trying to do in this section. For n, two or three, so two or three dimensional rotation matrices, we define the set of rotation matrices by SO of N, okay? So the S and the O go together here, it's one symbol, SO of N, which is the set R in, the set of R N by N, which is to say the set of N by N matrices such that the matrix R transposed times the matrix R is equal to the identity, and the determinant of the matrix R is equal to positive one. So here, the abbreviation SO stands for special orthonormal, where the word special is a reflection of the determinant being positive. Okay, so special means the determinant's positive and the set is often called the special orthonormal group, okay? Group, group. The formal definition of a group is given in section 6.5. So we looked at that in the appendix to the last chapter. The set SO of N has some basic properties. Property zero, closedness with respect to matrix product. So if R1 and R2 belong to SO of N, so the special orthonormal group of N by N rotation matrices, then the product R1, R2 belongs to the special orthonormal group of N by N matrices. So as you would expect, when you hit the matrix product of your rotation matrix and a rotation matrix, you also get a rotation matrix that belongs to the same group. P1, associativity, R1, R2, and R3 belong to the special orthonormal group. Then R1 times R2 times R3 is equal to R1 times R2 times R3. Okay, that's associativity. P2, zero rotation. The zero rotation is the identity matrix, I sub N, with the property that the rotation matrix R times I sub N is equal to I sub N times the rotation matrix equals R, our usual identity matrix. The inverse rotation is property three. For any rotation R, the inverse rotation always exists and is equal to the transpose of R. That is, R transpose R is equal to R, R transpose is equal to the identity matrix. Okay, note, given a frame sigma zero and a rotation matrix R, in SO3, because R has orthonormal columns and positive determinant, one can easily associate to R a frame sigma 1 such that R10 is equal to R. Another note, from these four properties above, one can verify that SO of N is a so-called group, as defined in the appendix above. The proof of these properties is left to the exercise 7.4. I'm gonna look forward to the three roles and uses of rotation matrices. Finally, it is useful to emphasize and clarify the three roles that a rotation matrix can play. One, the reference frame rotation matrix R10 describes the reference frame sigma one with respect to sigma zero, specifically, the columns of R10 are the basis vectors of sigma1 with respect to sigma0. 2. The reference frame rotation matrix R10 is the coordinate transformation from sigma1 to sigma0, as characterized by the equation P1 being rotated 
to P0. Any rotation matrix R in the special orthonormal group of N can be used to rotate a vector in Rn. For example, given a point P on the plane R2, that is set N equal to 2, define a new point Q as follows. The vector from the origin of the zero reference frame to Q is the rotation of the vector from the origin of the zero reference frame to P by an angle theta. That is Q0 equals RP0. This operation is illustrated in figure 7.1 below, where R is of the form cosine theta is along the diagonal, sine theta is on the off diagonal with the sine accordingly for a planar problem. So if we look at this, we have a point P, we're gonna rotate it to point Q by theta, and this is also used to describe a body rotating where we would just pick one point on the body to describe its rotation, and this is what the body would look like after it has rotated. So this is the rotation in the plane. Geometric properties of rotations. We are now able to verify that our proposed model of rotation matrices enjoy the geometric properties we initially discussed in section 6.2 from last chapter. We're going to quote from that section. One, rotations are operations on free vectors. They preserve length of vectors and angles between vectors. So given an array V, the array RV is the rotated version. Saying that length of vectors and angles between vectors are preserved is equivalent to the following equalities. If you take the transpose of V and you multiply it by W, so this would be the inner product or the dot product of V and W, then you can put in the transformation RV and RW, the transpose stays there, and we have the norm of V is equal to the norm of RV. Okay, so when you rotate a vector, it doesn't change its magnitude. We leave the proof of these two equalities to exercise 7.3. More to look forward to. Two, in three-dimensional space, there are three independent basic rotations. In vehicle kinematics, three basic angles are roll, pitch, and yaw. This fact is reflected by the definition in equation 6.4 of the three basic rotations, rotation about the axis X of the angle alpha, rotation about the axis Y of the angle beta, and rotation about axis Z of angle gamma. In section 7.3, we will explain how to express any rotation matrix as a product of appropriate basic rotations. Three. Rotations can be composed, and the order of composition is essential. The composition of rotations occurs via matrix multiplication. If R1 and R2 are rotation matrices, then R1, R2, and R2, R1 are rotation matrices. Indeed, matrix multiplication is not commutative in general. And in particular, rotations do not commute. That is, R1, R2 is not necessarily equal to R2, R1. For example, it is easy to verify that R1 being the rotation about x of pi over 2 and R2 being the rotation about y of pi over 2 satisfy these two products, rotation x, y, rotation y, x, and you see that the product of their rotation matrices are not the same. So we see this inequality emerge. We study the composition of rotations in the next section, so we're going to get a little bit deeper into how to know which order to use. Four, each rotation admits an inverse rotation. So the inverse rotation matrix of R is R transpose. Five, each rotation is a rotation about a rotation axis of a rotation angle. We postpone a discussion of this property to section 7.3.3 below. It's one of the last sections in this chapter. All right. That's all I've got for this lecture. I'll see you next time for section 7.2. Take care.